In 1951, when California surfer John Severson was 18, he bought a Keystone 16mm camera for $50 and began shooting a few rolls of Army surplus black and white film. At night, the local surf crew would gather at Severson's house, mix up a vat of pineapple rum punch, turn up the hi-fi, and run John's latest footage through the projector again and again. The Army should have put an end to all that. Instead, Severson was actually stationed in Hawaii and put on the Army surf team. He was ordered to show up at Sunset Beach and Makaha for team practice. Well, Severson, being the good recruit, did as he was told, and in his spare time, he began shooting film for his first movie, simply titled Surf. Hi, I'm Robert Weaver, and this is The Surfer's Journal. John Severson was born and raised in Southern California and began surfing in 1947 at age 13. He edited the high school paper and pitched for the varsity baseball team. He got a master's degree in art and then became a student teacher before getting drafted. In the late 50s, Severson decided to join Bud Brown as a full-time surf entertainment entrepreneur. With help from his wife Louise, Severson published the first issue of Surfer Magazine in 1960 to promote his third movie, Surf Fever. And demands from the magazine eventually took him away from making surf films. But from 1958 to 1964, during the genre's first big boom, he made one movie a year. In 1969, Severson came back and made one last film, the colorful Pacific Vibrations. Could you uh, tell us what you think of surfers? <laughs> They're cool. <laughs> John Severson was still in the Army when he finished his first movie and big wave surfer Fred Van Dyke agreed to take it to California and do live narration showings up and down the coast. It would be another year or two before Sievertson himself felt comfortable narrating his own films. John was strange because he, he had a great personality, he was a handsome guy, and at that time he didn't have that much confidence in himself. So he sort of thought he would have me around to help him, which I did. At first I was, I was pretty stiff and uncomfortable, and that's why I kind of, half the reason I sent Fred out, because Fred was comfortable talking, and, and I was not a public speaker and, and didn't consider myself, uh, or in fact, I was pretty sure I could never do it. <laughs> Jeff Hackman, formerly of Palos Verdes, moved to Hawaii last year and has really taken to the island surf. Tiny Jeff hot dogs extremely well at Haleiwa on his 7-8 homemade board. Outside, Butch Van Artsdalen drops in, switches feet, and switches back again. Wind and Sea surfer Van Artsdalen turned in one of the outstanding performances in the islands last year. Once again on the left, Butch, followed by Mickey Dora. Which again pulls a double switch. The first real film was Surf Safari, and where I had a chance to devote myself to the whole production. It, and I liked uh, Henry Mancini, and I liked that Peter Gunn theme. And I had taken a picture um, off, of, uh, off of my board, holding a Voight rubber bag with a movie camera in it, and shot my feet surfing uh, a red board blue-green water, white foam flying, and, and the little bubbles on the board uh, bouncing off the, the wax. and It was just great, with screaming audiences, standing ovations. In the middle of the film, they would stand up and cheer. And it was a, it was a wondrous time. Hawaiian surfer Jock Sutherland would later star in Pacific Vibrations. But in the early 60s, he was just another stoked Severson fan. 
the shot that sticks in my mind is maybe it was on Big Wednesday where the beginning of the of the film is just a huge wave in slow motion coming over and all the crowds going wild, flipping bottle caps, stamping, beating on their chairs on each other. John not only improved greatly as a filmmaker with each passing year, he also learned how to deal with an auditorium full of screaming surfers. I discovered early, too, that an audience was like uh, a single person. It, it sort of went in a wave, so you could play the audience, and you could bring them up and down and, and play them, and, and they were very enthusiastic and easy to be thrilled. Early last year, Tommy Lee drove out to the point at Wyomia Bay to check the surf. It was February 1962, and the biggest swell that anyone had seen all winter. Just about all the big wave riders had gone back to California, and the only surfer Tommy could find this day was Bob Pike, an Australian who was out on the point watching the giant crushers rolling through. Tommy Lee found out later how rideable they were to become as he picked up one of the worst big wave wipeouts in the history of surfing. Bob Pike, the Australian, and Tommy Lee. Tommy was first to paddle outside, followed by Pike. And here's Tommy Lee riding the first wave. Bob Pike really gets bombed. And here it is, Tommy Lee's phenomenal cannonball wipeout at Wyomia. An unbelievable shot and an unbelievable wipeout. Watch closely as we repeat the shot in super slow motion. The worst wipeout ever taken. John Severson was 26 in 1959, trying hard to set himself apart from the other surf filmmakers, Bud Brown, Bruce Brown, and Greg Knoll. As he finished up his third movie, Surf Fever, he decided to promote it with a 36-page photo booklet. He called it The Surfer. 10,000 copies were printed, but only 5,000 sold. Severson didn't make another issue of The Surfer until early 1961, but that one sold out completely, and a surf institution was born. I had this, this flash. I remember standing in my bedroom at 15 years old saying, Aha, I know how I'm going to make a surfing magazine when I grow up, and then I'll live off the magazine, and just surf and make the magazine. <laughs> yeah, it worked. The kids, kids wanted pictures. They would come up after the film, and, and Bud was giving black and white pictures for a dollar a piece off the, off the film. And they were, they were uh, real impressive pictures, not sharp, but very black, and big waves looked bigger and everything looked a little more dynamic and the kids loved these pictures and so I had to find a way to, to copy them off of the film and they would pay a dollar a piece and I thought well that's a lot of money uh, well, I had to do a program of all the best pictures off the film and, and, uh, and give them 60 or 80 pictures for a dollar and a half or something or a dollar and a quarter and that makes a lot of sense so uh, by the time I hit surf fever my third year I came out with this program. I called it The Surfer with a lot of thoughts of what to call it. Instead of calling it Surf Fever, I, I thought, well, this could go on, this will be an annual, and this could be the magazine or something. And that's how it started. Severson's background in art and graphic design was evident not just in his new magazine, but in the posters he made for his movies. The posters didn't take very long. They were not things that I labored over for uh, three or four months. 
often, uh, oh, got to get on that poster. And so I'd start in the morning, and by the next day, uh, I'd have the poster done. And they were very uh, stoked, inspirational things. Uh, surf Safari, Surf, surf Fever really uh, came out, I think, uh, as well as any poster that, that I did. tack these cool posters up and they'd last 15 minutes they'd be waiting the guys would be waiting around the corner and uh, we had a great loss of posters but uh, sort of got back a little bit uh, realizing that there was a demand for them they would write and say send me any posters you have so I would overprint the posters and make poster packs 10 for a dollar and we developed this tremendous business uh, it was bigger than the magazine at first Severson hired Rick Griffin to do the poster art for his last movie, Pacific Vibrations. Griffin had been a cartoonist at Surfer since 1961 and was best known among surfers as the creator of Murphy. I set him up in a house on the beach at Capistrano Beach and paid him steadily and what was supposed to be a month job and ended up six months or so. And uh, he finished the poster and it was fabulous, a great poster. And he said, well, I'll, I'll give you two tomorrow. And he had a friend in, and his friend and he got uh, into something, some uh, potion. And uh, he decided overnight that the poster wasn't what he wanted, and he painted it white. And I came the next day, and the poster was gone, painted white, and he had started over. So then he started all over and painted a whole new poster. And Louise and I had always agreed that that first poster was even better than the second poster and, and I didn't get a picture of it even and I can't remember what it was but it was a great great poster. During the making of Pacific Vibrations Griffin, Severson and a few friends painted a bus for a surf trip to the Hollister Ranch. The shortboard revolution rekindled John Severson's interest in surfing, but by the end of the 60s, he was already thinking about getting out of the surf business and out of California. Recently elected President Richard Nixon had just moved into the Western White House, right next door to Severson. And as far as Severson was concerned, the old Cotton's Point neighborhood was ruined. In 1969, he picked up his camera and began work on his final surf movie. The world had changed radically in the five years since Severson's last film. And the new one, Pacific Vibrations, reflected those changes. The inspiration for Pacific Vibrations was, uh, was the environmental uh, concern that I had. Um, I wanted to make a film uh, that would wake a lot of people up to uh, the ocean and, and our environment and, and what was going on, the pollution and the lack of care. I didn't really want to make another film to, uh, to make another great surf film. I wanted to make a statement and also make a beautiful film. And I knew I was headed out the door, it's kind of a swan song. And, and I thought I could make the kind of film that I never finished off in the early years. <laughs> It's a far out thing. 
It's the only way I'd like to, it's the only thing I'd like to do. But my parents know this, and so like, if I don't get a good grade on my report card, they won't let me serve until I, until I bring it up. And if I don't get a job, they'll use it against me. I can't serve. If I didn't surf, I don't know what they'd do. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have anything to hold against me. Their bite and their hair, wow. Bill Hamilton was the most polished surfer of the era, and Severson gave him a lot of screen time in Pacific Vibrations. In one of the movie's best sequences, Hamilton and Jock Sutherland went looking for surf on Maui. I heard you and Jock had a really good uh, trip over to Maui. Excellent trip. We started out North Shore, Oahu, and then uh, picked up a couple of Jock harmonicas and started jamming all the way down the airport, jammed all the way through the plane ride, jammed when we got on Maui, we finally came in some good waves at Windmill. was going from an establishment kind of person into a full-blown artist. Pacific Vibrations really broke away from all his other work because he was changing too as a person, as a, as a creative person. In the late 60s uh, uh, was a great time of change and I was upset, as upset as everyone else with the, the war and the way things were going and, and I lived next door to Richard Nixon uh, with Secret Service uh, people watching me all day long and walkie-talkies going and, and TV scanners and, and the whole thing just was uh, driven home to me that this that we were headed in uh, not a very uh, pleasant direction. Pacific, Pacific, Pacific Vibrations cost $200,000 to make and lost money at the box office. Parts of the movie were creative and beautiful, others missed the mark. But throughout, it had a unique kind of intensity, and this feeling was helped by the legendary Big Surf of 1969. We're almost to the airport, and we're listening to the radio, and, and the news announces, uh, this is a, a, a high weather warning. Uh, French Frigate Shoals is currently being washed over by huge ocean swells. So we turn around, Checked into a hotel, a Pioneer Inn in Maui, in Lahaina, and then drove out to, to uh, Honolulu Bay. Now, Honolulu Bay, it was, the sun was setting. Jacques and I were standing there, there was nobody around. And all of a sudden, we see the first swell of 1969, of that big swell hit. And that night, uh, John gets a call from his wife, and she's irate. She goes, John, they just evacuated the North Shore. He goes, really? How big is it over there? She says, it's 60 feet. Houses are in the middle of the road. And we, we went, oh, what are we in for tomorrow, you know? <laughs> says, well, we're gonna stay here. We're gonna surf Honolulu tomorrow. After breaking his board, Jock borrowed a red rocket, switched his stance. As soon as you take off on any big wave, you've got this uh, amount of adrenaline surging into your system. It's just flowing all the way through your hands and your, and your feet and your entire being, just so you can focus your pressures on what's happening in the wave. My perception of speed and time, it just seemed were temporarily arrested. And all that was happening was that the wave was doing all the movement. 
And I was the only static thing. You know. But coming into this too smooth and fast, clean, hissing feeling entering in the back door, everything went quiet. I could feel nothing. John Severson retired in 1971, when he was 38, and moved his family to Maui, where he's lived for the past 25 years, surfing, sailboarding, golfing, and painting. None of Severson's surf movies are available today. The early ones were either lost, stolen, cannibalized for other films, or ran through the projector until they were ruined. Pacific Vibrations is one of his only films still intact, but it can't be sold commercially because of problems with the music rights. Severson doesn't seem too upset about any of this. It was always the process itself that he most enjoyed. I didn't like shooting the film that much, although it's so exciting to get a good shot back. But to run around and stand in the heat when you'd like to be out surfing, that, that was tough. Um, I really liked the, the put together, editing, uh, picking the music, cutting the uh, you know, stuff all together and, and then writing a line and then, and then having it come out in front of, in front of an audience, having it, the, the thing realized. And uh, I, I think the creative process was what really knocked me out. Uh -huh. 